I never thought of it as God. I didn't know what to call it. I don't believe in devils, but demons I do, because everyone at one time or another has some kind of a demon, even if you call it by another name, that drives them. So said the late, great actor Gene Wilder. It's often thought that we all meet the devil at one point in our lives, and we're offered a deal. Do we take it, or do we turn it down? Now I've no way of knowing if I've met the devil yet, or if I've taken the deal or not. Now my dear friends, you know what time it is. It's time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. Don't let the devil in, not even once. He'll never let you go. That's what Mrs. Calloway says to the children in her town. The ones that flock to hear her tall tales and outlandish fakery every Halloween night. If you live in Roundhouse, Kansas, and have less than 13 years of life on you, it's socially expected that you pay the old matriarch a visit the week leading up to October 31st. She always has some new yarn hiding in the tanned folds of her skin, and she tells them with a mastery of the art that would have made Ease Up himself a little envious. She accepts donations, by the way. Her late husband's meager pension barely pays the rent. She gets to pick the tail, not you. It doesn't usually matter. They're all exquisitely extraordinary and melodiously menacing. Ghosts and serial killers, ghouls and zombies. They've all ridden her story train. Still... Most of them don't have the chutzpah or weight of that one tale that every child in Roundhouse waits to hear every year. The one tale that makes half of them come every night of that infamous week in the hopes that she'll tell it. It's supposed to be true, because it's the one she lived. Some 50 years ago, she married a 21-year-old, red-headed man with $50 to his name, and a persistent idea about opening up another general store in Roundhouse. That was all the ambition he had in him, but she didn't care. He was a good man who never laid a hand on her and never strayed. He wasn't upset when the doctor told him she was barren and never became despondent over the endless rejections of his loan applications. But he was a somnambulist, and she wasn't talking about those lightweights who got lost in their homes while they were half awake. Mr. Calloway lived another life in his sleep, taking long walks in the middle of the night up and down Horsehair Road in his bare feet and pajamas. He'd do it once a week, at least, with no warning or word. He'd just sit up, slip out of bed, mumbling gibberish. She consulted sleep experts, she used interior locks and restraints. She tried tranquilizers in his hot milk. Nothing worked. Not even God or the devil could have stopped him. She learned to bear it, to watch him leave and wait up for his return. She even walked with him on occasion out of concern and curiosity. All he did was walk to the old dry culvert, stare at it for a few minutes and then head back home. Mysterious, but it seemed harmless. Ten years of this went by, but they coped. Mr. Calloway tried to make up for it in other ways, with treats and vacations and marital satisfaction. But he had no answers to give, no reasons for his wayward jaunts. Four days before his 31st birthday, he had another episode. Normally, he just quietly left the bed like a man sneaking out for an illicit rendezvous. This time, he shook the bed in his frantic effort to leave, his mumbles now loud and urgent. Mrs. Calloway was so shaken by the change that she decided to walk with him again, to make sure he didn't harm himself. But he was almost sprinting at times, his bare feet slapping the dirt road hard. She couldn't keep up and he quickly disappeared over the crest of a nearby small hill, the one that led to the empty culvert and his usual stopping point. 
She reached the top of the hill a few minutes later, huffing and puffing from her exertion. But what she saw next managed to steal her laboured breath away entirely. There was a cloud right over Mr. Calloway's head. He was only a few hundred feet away, standing next to the culvert. The cloud in question was dangling over him like an impish cartoon rain cloud that had marked him for personal wetness. It was more rounded than most clouds, as big as a pickup truck and darker than the surrounding night. It had tendrils that flailed around slowly and quietly in the air, though there was no breeze to speak of. One of the tendrils was reaching down and touching the top of Mr. Calloway's head. He was completely oblivious to it, standing like an obedient statue. Her alarm began to grow as she watched the enigmatic scene unfold, but she could only watch as the tendril retracted from her husband's head, the cloud rising into the sky like an untethered helium bloom. So quickly did it rise that it was a mere dot in less than ten seconds, gone after a few seconds more. It made no sound and left no evidence of its existence. Mr. Calloway walked back as he always did, but the urgency had left him. She hadn't known what to do at the time, not wanting to risk psychological damage to her husband by waking him. So she followed him back to bed, resolving to explore the matter further in the morning. Mr. Calloway remembered nothing. Even after she described to him what she saw, he couldn't remember a thing. They visited the culvert again during the day, and found nothing but loose rocks and footprints. Mr. Calloway was laughing about it, claiming that this was one of her bad dreams. As real as it had been to her, she had to admit that the whole thing did seem rather surreal. He did allow her to comb through his red hair for any evidence she found a few moles, but nothing else. With only a hazy memory to go on, she dropped the whole matter. That was the last night he ever sleepwalked. It took a couple of weeks for the two of them to realize it, but his nocturnal travels had ceased all on their own. She was so grateful for his change in behavior that she forgot about that wild final night dismissing it as the product of her own turbulent mind. It was another two weeks before she recognized the second change in his behavior, when he missed his monthly hair appointment at the local barber. Then he missed the rescheduled appointment, and the one after that, and the one after that. He justified it by saying that he didn't trust the barber, despite having his hair cut by him for the last 20 years. When she offered to take him to another barber, he complained that they all overcharged or were too far away. When she offered to cut his hair at home, he balked at the idea, saying that he'd seen her hedge clipping prowess and didn't want to take the risk of getting scalped. And so, his hair grew. It grew and grew. And for a change of pace, it grew some more. He also became far more sensitive about his hair, not letting her run her hands through it and seldom getting it wet. His overgrown mop transformed into a ponytail that he self-braided. After five years, the ponytail behind him was halfway down his back. After ten, it was to his waist. By the end of the third decade, it was dragging on the floor and getting caught on every snag that he walked by. The whole thing disturbed Mrs. Calloway to no end. After three decades of watching her husband's reputation slowly sour and his physical appearance turn laughable, she would have eagerly traded the private nightmare of sleepwalking for the far more public dilemma she had now. Even the warehouse he worked for was threatening to fire him if he didn't control his hair, citing safety concerns. One morning, after nearly tripping over his ponytail for the 500th time, she sat him down and had the heart to heart she should have had years ago. She told him that she loved him 
and had stood by his side through his failed business ventures and his quirks. But his hair was hurting him, and now it was starting to hurt them. He needed to cut it off. Where before he'd been defensive about the subject, this time he listened. He agreed with her that his ponytail had gotten unmanageable, but he still feared the barber and asked her to come with him. She was more than happy to oblige. The appointment was three days later, at Murphy's Hair Joint, an old school barbershop by design. The stylist was quite young and quite full of himself. Like the rest of Roundhouse, he knew Mr. Calloway by reputation. He was very pleased to have the honour of shoring Mr. Calloway of the red menace attached to his head, though he was charging double the usual fare for the extra work. Mr. Calloway took to his barber stool like he was a condemned man. He cringed every time the scissors opened and closed, every time he saw the flash of the stylist's razor. He steeled himself as the young stylist hacked off his massive ponytail, his teeth gritted and his eyes shut tight. Mrs. Calloway had taken a seat in the waiting section, watching her husband's ordeal from the sidelines. She was hoping he'd calm down and realize how irrational his fears had been all these years. But he became even more agitated after the ponytail was severed, as if expecting the stylist to slice his throat at any moment. Cracking a joke about having to rent a U-Haul to carry off the discarded ponytail, the stylist grabbed a tuft of hair and began to cut it. He was halfway through the cut when Mr. Calloway's eyes flew open. A long, loud, terrible sound flew from his mouth. He bolted out of the chair, knocking the stylist out of the way and screaming the whole time. He screamed as he fled out the door. He screamed as he ran through town, holding his hands to his head and barreling past other pedestrians. Mrs. Calloway had been shocked into hesitancy initially, but she quickly recovered and ran after him. That night, from thirty years ago came back to her, and she feared for his life. But, as before, she couldn't match his speed, and he was lost from sight within seconds. She chanced upon Sheriff Robinson, who had heard the screaming from his office, and he gave her a lift home in his squad car. It was the most likely place for her husband to flee to, or so she hoped. Even with the squad car, Mr. Calloway beat them back home. He'd gone the direct route over land, sprinting at such an insane pace that he could have qualified for an Olympic medal. They found him sprawled on their porch steps, face down and motionless, except for his hair. To her horror, his hair was moving under its own power, twisting and weaving like a living mop. Sheriff Robinson kept her away and used the handle of an available broom to probe further. Under the crimson strands of Mr. Calloway's hair were... were... spiders. Climbing through his hair, climbing over each other, sinking their mandibles into Mr. Calloway's skin. Horrid, terrible things, those spiders. They'd been nesting in his hair all these years, only to be disturbed by the stylist into attacking their host and injecting their poison. She could see their scabby nests right next to his scalp, crusty and erupting with bright, milky fluid. His hair had been the camouflage, but not their true nest. They'd been living under it. The crimson streaks on their abhorrent bodies hadn't been their own colour. She ends the story with Sheriff Robinson and Mrs. Calloway killing all the spiders, but not in time to save her husband. Mr. Calloway was buried out back, near his parents' plot. He would have wanted it that way. The devil had touched him. That's her explanation. One way or another, the devil had it in for Mr. Calloway. Whether sleepwalking, dark clouds, or spiders in his hair, 
If the devil marks you, then you best beware. She knew her husband had sinned only in his youth, but that was all it took to let the devil into your life. Let that be a lesson to you, boys and girls. Now, Sheriff Robinson could tell you a different story if he wanted to. He knows she's not telling the real ending. He's listened to her story many times over. Every time she gets to the part about the spiders, he notes the moment of hesitancy in her voice. Most people would say that remembering such a horrible thing is probably taxing. He'd say it's because she wants to say the truth, but then changes her mind. Oh, if you could get him drunk, so drunk that he'd kiss a cow on a dare, you might get the truth from him. He'd largely back up Mrs. Calloway's story, at least the parts he was there for. But he'd tell you that they weren't spiders. No, they damn sure weren't spiders. It was the closest thing they resembled, though. They had eight of something all right. But you don't tell people such things. Not unless you want to end up in the mental hospital. Mrs. Calloway understood, and had agreed with him to keep silent. But that hasn't stopped her from telling stories, or him from coming up with his own ideas. The thing that she saw hovering over Mr. Calloway must have been hiding in or near that culvert all those years. It had snagged Mr. Calloway's mind, controlling him to some degree, forcing him to obey it when his conscious mind was resting. The creature had been summoning Mr. Calloway, testing Mr. Calloway, preparing Mr. Calloway. Why Mr. Calloway? No clue. Maybe he was just the poor fish that bid on the fisherman's line. But that final night, before it left this world, it performed one final task. It implanted its brood into Mr. Calloway's head that night, as well as an idea not to allow any harm to come to them. And he protected them for three decades until the day his love for his wife overrode the creature's command and a stylist ruined their hiding spot. The sheriff crushed them all, ground them into the dirt with his boots. He even bug-bombed the house. The things should be dead. But, well, he watches over Mrs. Calloway to this day, gives her donations every year, he keeps his ears out for any chronic sleepwalkers in town. He just can't shake the feeling that one of them got past him and that it's waiting and growing in one of the myriad holes of Roundhouse, waiting to snare another fish from the pond. He also keeps finding reasons to skip the barber shop, despite the growing shagginess of his hair. Yes, yes, yes. Fantastic little story there. And another big shout going out to all those of you who are working right now. Are you on the night shift? Are you doing some boring repetitive job? Hey, it's okay. I've been there. I did it for a few years. I know exactly how it feels. And that's what drives me on. I keep telling stories to help you through the boring, bad times. <laughs> Hope I'm doing a good job. Let me know, okay? <laughs> All right, my dear friends, that's it for another evening. But I will be back again soon enough. And I know you're going to join me again, aren't you? Yes, you are. Okay, until then, sweet dreams. and Bye-bye.
Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>